Let's take our Bibles and go to a text I've referred to numbers of times, and that is Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. I'm drawn to this text because it's one of the greatest distillations, kind of the boiled down version of what the Word of God is meant to do. Jeremiah 1, 9 and 10. Then Yahweh sent forth His hand and touched my mouth. And Yahweh said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to uproot and to tear down, to cause to perish, and to pull down to build, and to plant. This is what the Word of God is meant to do. Tonight in our continuing series of the Christ Honoring Church, I'd like to consider the topic of the Bible. And so with that, let's pray for a moment together. Our Father, we come to you now, having just read these stunning words of what you have proclaimed to the prophet Jeremiah that your words will do. They uproot, they tear down, they cause to perish, they pull down, and then they build and they plant. Your word is a double-edged sword. It is living and active. And I pray that tonight we would be reminded of the truths of the Bible and that the church of the living God must defend Scripture and must abide by Scripture, and must submit to the authority of Scripture. I pray that that would be our heart this evening. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Sir Thomas More was the Lord High Chancellor of England under King Henry VIII, and he described uh, someone he considered a religious enemy. And here's how Sir Thomas More described his religious enemy. He described this man as, quote, a hellhound in the kennel of the devil, a drowsy drudge drinking deep in the devil's dregs, I like that one, a new Judas, a man worse than Sodom and Gomorrah, an idolater and devil worshiper, a man discharging a filthy foam of blasphemies out of his brutish, beastly mouth. The man that Sir Thomas More despised was William Tyndale. William Tyndale was born in 1494, and the reason Moore despised Tyndale was primarily because Tyndale devoted his short life to putting the Bible into the hands of Englishmen in English. That was Moore's problem. Back in 1408, the Constitutions of Oxford placed a ban. It was illegal to translate any part of the Bible into English. This was viewed as heresy against the Catholic Church and was punishable by death. And I think it's important to remember that in England in this time, the Bible and the church's liturgy, by the way, was available only in Latin, and only a few actually knew Latin, including all the clergy. The, the pastors, the priests, they couldn't even read the Bible. And that they were charged with spiritual leadership. What did that mean? It meant that they had to take their orders straight from the church. They had to be told what was right and what was wrong. The leaders of the church were completely ignorant of the scriptures themselves. But Tyndale changed all of that. He illegally began translating the Bible, not from Latin, but straight from the Hebrew and Greek. And in fact, he was the very first to ever translate from Hebrew into English. And it was a translation with staying power. 90% of his original translation ended up in the King James Version. King James Version was not primarily a translation. It was mostly a revision of Tyndale's Bible. And so he did a great job. Tyndale was naturally gifted in languages. He was a, a, a brilliant man. He learned seven different languages. He studied at Oxford. He learned grammar, public speaking, logic, mathematics, music, geometry, and astronomy. And yet with all of this, he genuinely believed that all of his learning just paled in comparison to the glories of studying Scripture. And in fact, he made a study of study. He studied theological education and he made an observation that 
that the primary teaching method of theology students was to drive them as quickly as possible away from Scripture and toward philosophy. To separate them from Scripture. For Tyndale, the theological education of his day was designed to immunize students against the Word of God. In his great high priestly prayer, Jesus made a request of his Father on behalf of his disciples and all who would follow after them. He said very simply, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. In John 17, 17. What is Jesus saying? He's making a bold assertion. He's saying that sanctification... The setting apart of the believer in Christ's likeness, the setting apart of God's people is accomplished through the scriptures. This means that knowing the Bible, studying the Bible is far more than an academic effort. Rather, it's a pathway to conformity to Christ. And for the Christ honoring local church, this is paramount. Here at Grace Bible Church, we hold that long esteemed church name used for over a century now by thousands of churches, Bible Church. In my observation, though, the term Bible Church has, for all intents and purposes, lost its original meaning. It doesn't mean what it used to. I'll just to give you an example. One Bible Church that may or may not be in our own city, in our, their doctrinal statement concerning salvation, mentions the death of Christ, mentions sin, but doesn't actually explain how those two go together doesn't explain the full gospel. And and if you look at it carefully, it's a very carefully crafted statement to allow for non-Christians to feel integrated into the church without actually getting saved. Many are now indistinguishable from the seeker-sensitive philosophy, even though they have the name Bible Church on their sign. I compare this to the great pastor and seminary professor, Dr. S. Lewis Johnson. He served as pastor of Northwest Bible Church and then Grace Bible Church, love that name, in Dallas, Texas in the 1950s. He served at Believer's Chapel, which was a Bible church, for 30 years after that. Dr. Johnson preached through the entire New Testament, verse by verse, section by section, and this used to be normal. And I have to give you a unique perspective. Our family had the privilege of personally witnessing John MacArthur preaching his final message in his four-decade trek through the whole New Testament. And he rightly received about a five-minute long standing ovation. But what most people in that room probably didn't know is that used to be normal. There are countless pastors who have preached every verse of the New Testament because that's what Bible churches do. And so tonight I'd like to talk to you about the Bible and how it affects the church. I'd like to divide our evening a a little bit unevenly. First of all, I want to talk to you about ways God's people are functionally separated from the Bible. Secondly, I want to talk about the devastating effects on the local church. And then third, I want to give you five foundations of orthodox belief in Scripture, kind of lay our foundation. And then finally, what are the implications for a true Bible church? The implications for a true Bible church. We will go to some other scriptures. I'll just read them to you as we get there, though. First of all, I want to talk to you about ways that God's people are functionally separated from the Bible. Now, in Tyndale's era, the powers that be in the Roman Catholic Church were literally trying to keep the Bible out of people's hands. To separate them from scripture. And Satan's strategy in that realm worked for nearly a thousand years. During the Dark Ages in Europe, when it was impossible to get a copy of Scripture, and even if you did, almost nobody could read it, because everyone was illiterate. But with the providential invention of the printing press in 1440 by Johannes Gutenberg, and the illegal efforts of translation by men like Tyndale, the Bible was now becoming more and more accessible. And now the Bible is the most printed and highest selling book in history. But even though Satan's strategy to physically separate people from the Bible has failed, although it succeeded for nearly a a millennium, his strategy to separate the church from the Bible in more subtle ways is raging in full force. And it's much more subtle. I'm just going to give you some samples. The first way God's people are separated functionally, I'll call this vaccination through moralization. Vaccination through moralization. One of the concerning trends which separates God's people from the Bible is the use of Scripture in sermons and Bible studies solely for the purpose of moral lessons. 
This has the effort, of, the, the effect rather of vaccinating people against the Bible because it diminishes it into a vaguely uh, Jesus-related book of morality instead of a book with a redemptive story start to finish. And frankly, professing Christians have heard moralized preaching for so many decades that they don't know any other way to view the Bible. Some of you have had this experience. I've heard some of you tell me that you've walked in here and heard just one of our normal sermons and said, I've been in church for 40 years. I've never heard this. The story of David and Goliath becomes a moral story about slaying the giants in my life instead of a guarantee that through David, a Messiah will come. The parable of the Good Samaritan becomes about being a nice person instead of the condemnation of the self-righteous. Even Christ's death on the cross becomes a lesson on self-sacrifice instead of the propitiation of the sin debt owed to a rightly furious holy God. And so this opens the doors for true believers who are stunted in their spiritual growth and even more dangerously for non-believers to think themselves Christians because they agree with the moral lessons. I agree with all the lessons I've heard from the Bible. There's a second way people are functionally separated. Authorial intent is foreign. Authorial intent is foreign. Every book of the Bible has two authors, the divine author and the human author. The divine author having superintended the human author to place the words in exact, precise uh, as the words of God and determining from diligent study The intended purpose of the author is paramount to interpreting any passage of Scripture. As a preacher, I need to have the integrity to know that any passage of Scripture from which I teach and preach is taught in conformity to the author's intent. And I think that makes sense to us. Anything you write, you want represented correctly, correct? But believe it or not, this is actually pretty rare in preaching today. And since the people of God tend to take their cues from the ones teaching them, I dare say that most Christians have never even considered the question, what was the author's intent in their quest to determine the meaning of a given text? And this has led to just a horrible trend, and I would call this the wholesale commercialization of Scripture. I don't mean the selling of Bibles or good books to help you understand the Bible. I mean the commercialization of books, children's media programs, Bible studies that completely ignore God's intention for a Bible book and simply make a text mean whatever the seller of those materials want it to mean. I'll give you an example. Simply, very simply, by understanding first that the purpose of the book of Acts was first and foremost to demonstrate to Theophilus, a Roman official who had declared faith in Christ, to demonstrate to Theophilus that salvation in Christ is available to anyone even to a Roman Gentile, then Acts now opens up in new realms of understanding based on understanding and grasping that purpose. Now the success of the gospel, first to the Jews, then to the Samaritans, then to the Gentiles, comes into focus. Now the proclaiming of the gospel literally to Rome itself and to Roman officials by Paul comes into focus. Theophilus, reading the book of Acts, coming to the end of Acts, saying, wow, God brought Paul all the way to Rome. I'm a Roman. God wants Romans to be saved. The purpose opens it up, and yet it's almost never considered. It's considered uh, bookwormish or intellectual. There's a third way that God's people are functionally separated from the world. A carelessness for context. A carelessness for context. This is similar to the previous point, but I want to make a distinction. If the average church attender in the congregation never hears his pastor utilize the context of a verse or the context of a passage to draw the interpretation of that passage, it's unlikely he's going to grasp how important context is. But every verse in Scripture is meant to be understood in light of the verses before it and after it. The sections before and after, the overall thrust and themes of the Bible book itself, and even the covenant context of the book. What testament is it in? This is vital to the integrity of the text. Otherwise, instead of the Bible dictating what the Bible means, the preacher is dictating what the Bible means. And that can never be the case. Let's just give you a, a common example. Paul declares to the Philippian church that my God will fulfill or supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. In Christ Jesus. That's a great promise. 
And it's a wonderful promise for us from Philippians 4.19. But it's more helpful to know that the context of God's declaration to the Philippians is that they, as a church, had been abundantly generous with Paul, even to their own sacrificial hurt. That's the context. This is not that Christians can just make a name it and claim it. My God's going to give me anything I want. No, this is God will supply your needs because you have given even to your own hurt. And he'll respond to that. He was assuring them that although they gave to their own detriment, because of this faithfulness, God would abundantly provide for them. You see how the context makes a difference? Here's a fourth way that God's people are functionally separated from the Bible. We'll call this a denigration of Bible knowledge. A denigration, a putting down, a mocking of Bible knowledge. The emotion-centered focus in the church, at least in the United States, began roughly in the mid-1800s. And it began a slow trend toward devaluing knowledge of the Bible and overvaluing a perceived spiritual encounter with God. As a pastor of a Bible church, I've even had fellow believers say to me something to the effect of, oh, you pastor one of those head knowledge churches, like it was some sort of insult. Their perception is that these head knowledge churches are really just, we're just filling our arrogant minds with a lot of Bible facts that we're just a Bible trivia church or something like that. We don't know anything about genuinely encountering God. I've had people tell me, oh, you're, you're, a, you're a head knowledge church, but you're not filled with the Spirit. You don't have a Spirit-filled church. Like those two are at odds with one another. I don't even know what to say to that. And where do you start? And here's the common argument. Well, the Bible says that knowledge puffs up. And it does. In 1 Corinthians 8, 1. See also our topic on context. A quick review of the context of 1 Corinthians 8, 1 reveals that Paul is not denigrating knowledge of the Scriptures wholesale. The context is that some in the church at Corinth had a greater understanding of the implications of eating meat sacrificed to idols, and this knowledge was making them arrogant toward their less knowledgeable brothers and sisters. Paul's point is that some of the Corinthians were high on theology and low on love. The solution is not to be low on theology. The solution is to be high on love. High on theology, high on love. And by the way, if you're going to talk about context, an author has a context because Paul has many other writings. In many other places, he pushes the Christian toward knowledge. Paul prayed for the Colossians that they would be filled with the full knowledge of God's will. In Colossians 1.9, even a few verses after telling the Corinthians that knowledge puffs up, he commends knowledge to them as valuable. Quite a number of times, Paul declares that he doesn't want God's people ignorant of truth. We don't want that ignorance. Here's a fifth way that God's people are functionally separated from the Bible. Preachers who don't study. Preachers who don't study. And for me as a preacher, honestly, I grow a little weary at times of the common advice and even the philosophy of ministry that says that preaching should be low-hanging fruit. The basic truth should be very, very easily grasped. Now, I understand the sentiment of trying to make God's word understandable and accessible, but honestly, I take it as an insult against you. It's basically saying, look, your congregation are too stupid to figure out what you're saying, so you really have to dumb it down for them. That's insulting. Every person who stands in a pulpit and proclaims God's word at one time was out there. So it is possible. And the way I like to say it, if I can understand it, anybody can. So that's the way we're going to look at it. But that philosophy, do you hear the shadows of Roman Catholicism in that? You're too dumb to understand, so I'm going to pull back and really dumb it down for you. And because of this philosophy then, it becomes all too easy for the preacher to throw together some simple sermon with a couple of feel-good illustrations and applications to just barely meet the requirement of a sermon And that's sad for his congregation. It's even sadder when the congregation now believes that's what's normal. Instead, I think Paul's admonition to Timothy is correct. He's to be one who is accurately handling the word of truth. 2 Timothy 3.15. It means to accurately divide it, to cut it straight. I think that 
The preacher who spends more time on everything else in the ministry than he does with meeting with God in his word, using the pickaxe of language study, using the shovel of proper hermeneutics, the dynamite of historical and contextual analysis is absolutely failing his people. Because now, rather than mining new treasures out of the ground, he just keeps polishing up a few precious stones he dug out a long time ago. And so in far too many cases, God's people are functionally separated from the Bible. Uh, Think about this for a minute. Since Tyndale's English translation of the New Testament in 1526, approximately 900 English translations have been published. There are also countless Bible websites. There are countless mobile phone apps. There are online libraries of Bible journals and commentaries. And yet, despite all of that, I would agree with Theologian Sinclair Ferguson, he says, despite all these translations and all the variety of packaging in which they come, it seems that Christians read and understand their Bibles less today than their forefathers did. So what does this do? What has this done to the church? I want to move on now to the devastating effects on the local church. What are the devastating effects on the local church? And we have to start with the negative so that we can revel in the positive here. I think rather than asking the question, how is the separation of God's people from the Bible, how has that impacted the church? It might be easier to say, how has it not impacted the church? Because it's really just hit us in every regard. I would say that every single facet of life in the church is impacted to one degree or another. But I'll, I'll give you a few examples of the devastating effects of a local congregation that has been slowly separated from her Bible. Not in any particular order of importance. Here's one effect. The church loses its most mature members. The church loses its most mature members. A local church which keeps its membership ignorant of Scripture tends to frustrate those members whose own study, in some cases, have moved them beyond the the elders of the church, moved them beyond the pastor. And these are often the members who are leading Bible studies. They're informally mentoring, mentoring others. And yet, because they themselves are not being fed, their frustration can mount and And the local church then loses their most valuable members because they're frustrated. They're not being fed. There's another devastating effect. The gospel is skewed. The gospel is skewed. When the priority of the church becomes open-armed acceptance of anyone who walks through the door, then the message of the gospel starts down that slippery slope of being sanitized to be palatable, to be acceptable to the unbeliever. Listen, the true gospel is shocking to the unbeliever and it's meant to be. Then this becomes a habit. Then it becomes a philosophy of ministry. Then it becomes an ingrained, hardened belief system that the gospel must be made palatable. Here's another devastating effect. Sanctification is inhibited. Sanctification is inhibited. I mentioned earlier that Jesus was very clear that the means of the spiritual growth into Christ-likeness, sanctification, is the Word of God, John 17, 17. But when you separate God's people from the Scriptures, even in subtle ways, that sanctification is stunted. It's like like depriving a, a plant of oxygen and food and water. Oh, lots of Bible verses might be read. Lots of what do you think it means Bible studies might be held But only when the word of God is unleashed on God's people does the transformative work of Christ's likeness really begin to accelerate. It has to be that way. Here's another devastating effect. Emotionalism replaces truth. Emotionalism replaces truth. Now, I'm I'm personally an emotional man. I feel it's a blessing and a curse at the same time, I suppose. It's a blessing when it helps me feel something deeply in my soul and it's a curse when emotions threaten to overtake me. And so it's a double-edged sword. But all of us at our core, we yearn for an experience with God, don't we? We do yearn for an experience with God. This is not in and of itself wrong. In fact, that's right at every level. Psalm 37.4 commands us to delight yourself in Yahweh. It's a word that means be refreshed in God. And we yearn for that. And as we mentioned this morning, our our worship is to be utterly God-focused, but we receive refreshment in worship, don't we? But you cannot commune with, you cannot fellowship with a God you barely know. 
And when the local church is separated from the Bible in various ways, the yearning to experience God leads to the creation of emotionally charged and designed gatherings meant to do nothing more than elicit emotion. And this actually becomes somewhat addictive. Why? Because the emotion is sort of like sugar. It, it gives you a, a, a boost for a minute, but then it drops off quickly and you need more. The emotion is based on the conjuring of emotional repetitive music or a frenetic preacher who dances around and builds excitement. Then you have to get another fix, another dose. By the way, uh, we talked about this during uh, our sermon on worship this morning, but this is also the case for those leading the church. Those who lead a church that is based in building emotion only, some church buildings actually have rooms that are called hype rooms where the, the pastor and maybe some of the musicians get together and they literally start jumping around, start getting their bodies physically excited, getting adrenaline built up in their bodies so that they can come and try to transfer that to you. That's weird, first of all. <laughs> Second of all, they're on the same drug they're trying to feed their congregation. But if you want to commune with God, the more you know Him, the deeper and more satisfying your experience of walking with God becomes. Now the truths of God, the truths of Scripture are whispering to your soul as you meditate on the depths and the heights of the magnificent realities that you constantly bathe in when we gather together as God's people. There's another devastating effect of separating God's people from the word, arrogance replaces humility. Arrogance replaces humility. One of the greatest blessings in my life is I have the privilege of being acquainted at one level or another with a great many men in the gospel ministry, and, and I really don't take that for granted. But because of this, I can make an assertion with a lot of ease and with a lot of confidence. The most intelligent and learned men I know in the ministry are generally also the most humble. Now, that sounds like it's at odds with each other, but the flip side is also the most arrogant men I've come across as pastors or elders are generally the most ignorant of the Word of God. Now, of course, there are those who are humble in their acceptance of how much they have yet to learn, but the pastors and elders I've come across who demonstrate great haughtiness are really in that sad position of being those who don't even know what they don't know. Arrogance replaces humility. Humility. There's another devastating effect. Worldly solutions are acceptable for spiritual problems. Worldly solutions are acceptable for spiritual problems. Because the view of Scripture is low, the authority of Scripture is denigrated, the Bible is reduced to some moral stories, then when the larger problems of life come upon a professing Christian, he's quick to default to worldly godless solutions. It's like the couple I counseled with a few years ago who stated to me, we tried God and the Bible, now we need counseling. Well, and then they were disappointed when I picked up my Bible. Like, no, we already tried that. The church has for so long accepted that secular psychology is acceptable to solve spiritual problems that most don't even question it anymore. Somehow a rift has developed such that the Bible is now relegated to solving a, a very small, narrow contingent of problems. And some have even said, well, the Bible is just for spiritual problems. All problems are spiritual problems. They all are. All problems require from a Christian a Christian response. And this response is found only in Scripture. There's another devastating effect. Church discipline is abandoned. Church discipline is abandoned. There's an observable correlation between the dynamic of how seriously the Bible is taken and the purity of the church. That is very observable. On the one hand, the church which highly values the Scriptures, which in turn requires obedience to the Scriptures, may find itself in obedience to Scripture, exercising church discipline. And on the other hand, the church which fancies itself loving and accepting of everyone with a low view of Scripture, finds itself with a church polluted by godless frauds who now impact the overall culture of the church. I had a pastor talked to me a couple of years ago at Shepherd's Conference, and he, he said, I don't know how to say this, but I'm pretty certain most of my church is not saved. What do I do with this? And one of the questions I asked him, well, when was the last time the church practiced church discipline? He said, we never have. 
We never have. Every time a man's having an affair, we just say, well, we'll pray for you. Or every time someone's stealing from his company, we say, well, we'll pray for you. I didn't know what to tell him. I just told him, start preaching the gospel. And then you're going to get fired. And then you can go to a church where they want to hear what you have to say. Here's another way the devastating impact on the church. Leadership standards become low. Leadership standards become low. If the scriptures are a mild addendum to the Christian faith, and certainly the qualifications of leadership as listed in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 are not to be taken any more seriously than the rest of scripture. And now the church creates its own standards for leadership. Well, I'm a success in business. I have a winning smile and personality. My dad planted this church. I taught a Bible study once. I give a lot of money. I've been here for 10 years. There's all kinds of reasons to say, oh, I'm qualified as an elder. And leadership at times is, is treated like a reward as a position in the president's cabinet when you helped with a campaign. Instead, we're reminded in Acts 20, 28 that the Holy Spirit chooses the leaders of the church. And the means by which this occurs is the training and approval given by previously qualified elders. And this is not a figurehead position. The elders are to shepherd the flock of God among you. 1 Peter 5, 2, they are to be those who labor and work and lead and admonish. 1 Thessalonians 5, leadership is not meant to be an easy attainment. Paul told Timothy to not lay hands upon anyone hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. 1 Timothy 5, the leadership of God's people is the most solemn work there is on earth. And separating God's people from the scriptures will lower the standards of leadership every time. It always will. So what do we hold to? What would we go to the stake for? Let me give you five foundations of orthodox belief in scripture. Five foundations. This is not exhaustive. It's not comprehensive. It's just a declaration of orthodoxy concerning the word of God. And let it be a test of your own beliefs and a standard which you measure a local church. There's five foundations. The first one, inspiration. Inspiration. The term inspiration comes originally from 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. The original New American Standard, which the Legacy Standard Bible is based on, reads, all scripture is inspired, but God breathed is a literal rendering of the Greek word theopneustos, so it's God breathed. The God breathed nature of Scripture comes about by the superintendence of the Holy Spirit upon the biblical writers. We get a precise description of this in 2 Peter 1.21, which says that Scripture was not formed by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Orthodox Christianity affirms verbal plenary inspiration that every word, all the parts of the Bible are equally inspired. There are not some less inspired and some more inspired. Neither would we say that the word of God is, that, that is contained in the Bible. The Bible is the word of God. Inspiration, this is the bedrock of bibliology. All other foundations rise and fall on inspiration. And we as a church should never forget this. We ought to be continually reminded that the Bible we open each week together was breathed out by God. It's something eternal, it's divine, it's glorious, it's heavenly. There's a second foundation, inerrancy. Inerrancy, the Bible is without error. The scripture in the original manuscripts does not affirm anything contrary to fact. That's how Wayne Grudem puts it. I'll mention several affirmations of inerrancy. First of all, Scripture always treats other Scripture as inerrant. Every time. There's not a single place where one Scripture corrects another. Peter doesn't say, well, Paul said this, but what he really meant was. In fact, Peter says, Paul, as in other Scriptures. He affirms it. There's a second affirmation of inerrancy. The Bible says some combination of God said, or thus says Yahweh, some 3,800 times. This isn't merely a Bible making a claim for itself. All the men who wrote and all the men who believed, thus saith the Lord as the nature of the Bible, were witnesses to this. Just minor men like Moses and Joshua 
and David and Daniel and Nehemiah and John and Paul affirm the inerrancy of Scripture? How about Jesus affirming the inerrancy of Scripture? And the third affirmation of inerrancy, the character of God himself testifies to inerrancy. This is a very simple logic. Since God himself cannot lie, Titus 1, 2, since God is truth, John 14, 6, since God's word is truth, John 17, 17, and since God is all powerful, then an inerrant Bible is the only option. There is no other option. In 3,500 years of writing the writings of Scripture, there's never been a demonstrated error in the Bible. Not one. Inerrancy applies to all parts of Scripture as originally written. Now, any copy is going to contain a few weaknesses due to transmission and translation problems, and some of your Bibles will have little footnotes. But we enjoy what, what is called derived inspiration that the copies and translations are inspired to the extent that they reproduce the originals. And don't be afraid of that because no ancient work has ever been given the attention to transmission and translation like the Bible has. There's not even a close second. And so the Bible you hold in your hand is a completely reliable copy of original manuscripts. And no major doctrine, no major part of the Christian faith rests on any contested or slightly difficult passage. None. Inerrancy doesn't claim that every event is reported from the same viewpoint. For example, the Gospels place different emphases on different events and implications of the life and ministry of Christ, and yet they can all be perfectly harmonized. There's a third foundation, authority. Authority. If the Bible is both inspired and inerrant, even simple human reason says it must be authoritative. If it is from God and contains no errors, then it must have authority. But we would make this distinction. The Bible does not possess merely subjective authority. Subjective authority says that all of us together have agreed that the Bible is our authority. Can you think of another document that has subjective authority? How about the Constitution? The Constitution of the United States has subjective authority because we as a nation, or most of us at least, have decided that that is our authority. But the Bible doesn't possess merely subjective authority. It possesses objective authority. It's not authoritative simply because we agree it's our authority. It's inherently authoritative and doesn't really care whether you agree with that or not. The way authority is confirmed is through the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works through the Scriptures to confirm the objective authority of Scripture placing us in the position of confidence and accountability to the Bible as God's very words. And you might say, well, that's, that's sort of circular reasoning. The Bible and the Holy Spirit can't testify to itself. Uh, what higher authority are you going to go to? There is no higher authority. And I would appeal to Hebrews 12, the great cloud of witnesses, thousands of years of believers who say, yes, the Bible contains inherent authority. How does this work? 1 Corinthians 2 gives us a powerful witness to the internal witness of the Holy Spirit. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, 4 that his preaching of Scripture came to the Corinthians in demonstration of the Spirit and power. He said in verse 10 that the mysteries of the Word of God were revealed through the Spirit. And in verses 13 and 14, that only by the Spirit of God are the depths and the riches of the Word of God grasped. I love this as a preacher. The Word of God has authority. All I'm called to do is tell you what it says. And the Word of God does its work. Bishop Hugh Latimer had something to say about this. He was a hero of the faith in the early days of the Reformation in England. And he was among many pastors really fighting against the Roman Catholic notion that the Bible was equaled in authority by church tradition or by the church itself or by clergymen or by the prayer book. Anything and everything and so when he was invited to preach a sermon to King Edward VI, Latimer took his shot. He said, quote, I will tell you what a bishop of this realm once said to me. He sent for me and marveled that I would not consent to such traditions as were then set out. And I answered him that I will be ruled by God's book. And rather than depart one jot from it, I would be torn by wild horses. He said that in front of the king. The king. 
I think the implications of authority ought to be obvious. And in fact, Scripture tells us the primary implication. James wrote in James 1.22 that we are to become doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. Scripture is the divine referee. Scripture is the divine judge. Scripture is the arbiter of all things. The local church and her individual members are compelled to examine themselves in light of Scripture alone. Here's another foundation. Infallibility. Infallibility. Easy way to remember this is that infallibility of Scripture says that Scripture is unfailable. It can't fail. Isaiah 55, 11 says, So will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. Romans 1, 16 says that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to all who believe. David Dixon believed this. He was a Scottish preacher who was born in 1583. And he was a preacher in Irvine. It's a little place on the eastern coast of southern Scotland, if that means anything to you. And he was actually married for quite a few years without children. And so he devoted his life to the spread of the gospel. In 1618, that's when he was ordained as minister of Irvine. He remained in that pastorate for 23 years. But his preaching was so intensely biblical that people from all around the area would travel for hours to hear him preach. In fact, many families uprooted their family farms. They gave up their family businesses to move to Irvine so they could be under Dixon's preaching weekly on the Lord's Day. His preaching was taken note of by many witnesses. And so we have notes. There There were no recording devices, but we had people writing down what his preaching was like. And one witness said that his preaching was, quote, Full of solid, substantial matter, very scriptural, and in a very familiar style, not low, but exceedingly strong, plain, and moving the affections. But far beyond even his preaching ability, Dixon was also described as one completely devoted to his own personal study of the scripture. His sermons were just an outworking of his own personal study. One theologian said the true glory of Dixon is his devotion to biblical studies, And so he set his heart on a Scotch commentary on the scriptures. And this became his life's work. He began to commission various uh, Scottish scholars to write commentaries on many books of the Bible. And Dixon himself wrote a commentary on Psalms, which was so good that a couple of hundred years later, Charles Spurgeon was still using Dixon's book on Psalms as a resource for himself. Dixon was consumed with helping preachers exposit the scriptures with clarity, with accuracy, with depth. And in fact, the next generation of preachers was so highly influenced by Dixon that preachers who learned from his preaching and writing became a a known group as, as those who were deeply convicted and convinced of the power of the word of God. One historian wrote, If there was any conviction deeper than another in their hearts, speaking of this group of pastors who was trained by Dixon, it was that the Holy Scriptures contained the whole counsel of God and that the business of the preacher and pastor, listen to this, was to transfer the Scriptures in all their fullness to the hearts of his hearers with equal profundity of conviction. They felt that the Lord Jesus Christ was the supreme glory of Scripture. In other words, the scriptures being wholly infallible, unfailable, must be trusted completely as sufficient for all life, for all practice, for all faith. You know, Dixon's testimony and the doctrine of infallibility reminds us that there's never a point in the Christian life, not once, where we say, well, the Bible has reached its limit of helpfulness. Now we move on to a different source of help. There's never a point in the life of the church where we say, well, the Bible didn't come through for us on dealing with this issue. Now we move to a different source of help. Let me give you one more foundation, and we'll call this one clarity. Clarity. Clarity is the simple term. Theologians use the term perspicuity. The clarity or perspicuity of Scripture says that the central message of the Bible is understandable. That the Bible can be correctly interpreted the same way you interpret any other writing. In a normal, literal sense, using the basic building blocks of language and logic, 
that you interpret anything else. This was a major issue during the Reformation in that the Catholic Church taught that the Bible is too mysterious, it's too obscure for for common people to understand. The Bible is unclear, and therefore regular people can't be trusted to interpret the Bible for themselves. They shouldn't be allowed to read the Bible for themselves. What is this? This is a spiritual Trojan horse. This is a Trojan horse, which was a satanic way for Catholics to have complete control over the people, telling them whatever they want. And this is a serious problem even today. Listen carefully. If a so-called, and I say this on purpose, if a so-called major doctrine of the Bible can only be understood if highly trained theologians or pastors explain it to you using obscure and complex logic to arrive at the conclusion, you have now been separated from your Bible rather than drawn to a greater understanding of Scripture. I'll give you an example. I don't believe for one minute that the average Christian would come to the conclusion that infants should be baptized just by observing Scripture. Primarily for the reason that there isn't a single example or command of infant baptism in Scripture. The logic to arrive at that conclusion is complex and it is reverse engineered. And I have read what I think is the very best and easiest to understand treatment of infant baptism And it still doesn't make sense because it's reverse engineered. What does that mean? It means you reach a conclusion first and then you go backwards in theological logic so that you can say, I arrived at this through exegesis. But it didn't work that way. I want to be very clear about this. The purpose that I serve, the purpose that your teachers of the word serve, the purpose of preaching and teaching is not to give you theological information that's completely unavailable to you, but it's to edify your minds and your hearts and to, uh, I can put it this way, accelerate your knowledge of the Scripture. The 15 or 20 hours that I spend on a message is 15 or 20 hours you don't have, and so I can compact it for you. But let let me put it to you this way. If I said to one of you, I would like for you to write a 30,000 word book on the character of God. You might say, I'm not a trained theologian. I I could never write a 30,000 word book on the character of God. But the doctrine of clarity or perspicuity says that if you devoted your life to it, going verse by verse through the Bible, maybe if you had a little longer life even, you could do that. Why? Because of the clarity of Scripture. We just don't have time to do that. And so God has set up an amazing system. And the system is, is that he raises up men, who a few men who spend their lives going deep in the word and then telling you what it says. But you can do it too. And we encourage you to. So what are the implications for a true Bible church? What are the implications? And I, I've said this before, but I'm kind of skeptical of church names. I'm not a big fan of it. I, I find it, I guess, a necessary thing in our current culture that it always feels a little bit like we're naming a baseball team and it feels competitive. I mentioned earlier, a name doesn't always accurately tell you the character of a church. So when I talk about the implications for a Bible church, what I mean are the implications that the foundations of our belief in Scripture ought to have for every church. Every church that desires to follow Christ truly and take Him at His word I have friends in the ministry. The names of their churches are as varied as, as personality. They're just all over the map, and yet we believe exactly the same thing, but the, the, the names are just different. I want to suggest five implications for every church the Lord willing, we implement in our church. The first one is self-evaluation. Self-evaluation. Sinclair Ferguson has a habit when he preaches in churches to ask elders He gathers the elders, and he's old enough to to be able to do this. He says, how would you describe your church? How do you describe your church? And one time he received the answer, we are a biblical church. And he said, well, what does that mean? And they followed up with, a biblical church is one where the Bible is used in the pulpit. Well, he was very kind, but he made the observation that there are lots of churches that no one would describe as biblical, and yet the Bible is used. Instead, Ferguson gives this definition. I think it's, it's weighty. A biblical church is one in which the Bible gets out of the pulpit, as it were, and begins to move into the congregation. 
giving into our lives, changing us, challenging us, convicting us, motivating us, and pointing us to all the resources of God, the Bible is not merely educational, it is transformational. Now, self-evaluation is not an easy task for churches because there are two groups that tend to get in the way of self-evaluation, the leaders and the members. Those are the two groups. The leaders might get in the way because self-evaluation puts them in a position to admit a need for a major course correction. It might even mean the need for more stubborn leadership to step down. The members might get in the way because they've gotten used to certain practices and tradition and And an honest self-evaluation might mean moving away from some of those security blankets that we develop in the church. Here's another implication. Endless treasures. Endless treasures. If the local church will truly hold to the foundations of our belief in the Bible, then the priority for the church will now be to continue mining these endless treasures of Scripture This operates under the assumption that an eternal book should yield eternal spiritual wealth, shouldn't it? I like the story of Henry G. Fish. Henry Fish was a pastor of a large church in Newark, New Jersey in the mid-1800s. He was born in 1820 and died in 1877. He was pastoring right during, right in the heart of the American Civil War. But his priorities were higher. They were loftier. They were on bigger things. In 1862, he wrote a long article which appeared in the British and Evangelical Review magazine. And this article was entitled, Power in the Pulpit. And titles like that always grab my attention. So I I read it, and this is what he wrote. Preachers who saturate their sermons with the Word of God never wear out. The manna which they bring is pure and sweet and freshly gathered. It never cloys, it means to sicken or nauseate. God's word is deep, and he who studies it will ever have something new. He will never be dull, for the words of the Bible are strong, living words, and its images and descriptions are very flowers of elegance. The words of God shed light into his subject like like windows in houses, while to most of his hearers, these very words of the Holy Spirit are delightfully edifying. They come like sweet-throated birds with a melody to the soul." Fish's contention is that the word of God never runs dry. If this is the church's heart, if this is the church's belief, then the minds of God's Bible will continue to yield its diamonds and its emeralds and its rubies and its sapphires. I've been asked a few times, I've been in the ministry long enough now to, I guess, be considered experienced, and people will say, do you ever worry you'll run out of things to say? My worry is I won't have time to say one millionth of what is in Scripture. I'm old enough now. I'm looking to the finish line. I hope it's 20 or 30 years away, but I'm thinking, what can I leave out? And there's nothing I want to leave out. No, that's a silly question. The minds of God's Bible will continue to yield its truth. Here's a third implication we'll call holy reverence. Holy reverence. I mentioned this this morning. I think this is something often lost in evangelicalism today. Even the quick reading of Psalm 119 will reveal an absolute awe and reverence that the psalmist has in his heart for Scripture. But his awe is not merely a distant respect for an active Word of God. It's close up. It's personal. It is for a Word of God that is dynamic and powerful. In verse 50, he credits the Scripture with giving him eternal comfort. He says... This is my comfort and my affliction that your word has revived me. You might be more familiar with the declaration in Hebrews 4.12 that the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. I want to go back to Sinclair Ferguson. He tells really good stories and I, I enjoy his perspective so much. And he tells a powerful story about his childhood in the church in Scotland. Early childhood all the way through young adulthood, actually. He tells this story, unlike our pulpits today, the pulpit in that era in Britain was often a completely enclosed structure. It was its own unit. It had steps leading up to the pulpit, and then there was a gate to enter into that pulpit. Many churches had a balcony around all three walls, and so the pulpit was situated high above the floor, really elevating both the acoustics and symbolizing the 
solemnity of preaching the word of God. And Ferguson recounts a very important memory that was common to many churches. He says this. As the congregation waited for the service to begin, a man would appear from some hidden room carrying an enormous black pulpit Bible. He would mount the pulpit steps and carefully place it on the reading desk, ceremoniously open it. This man, known throughout Scotland as the Beadle, B-E-A-D-L-E, would then come down the pulpit steps and allow the minister to enter the pulpit. Then the Beadle would follow behind the minister back up the steps and close the door behind him, moving the door catch so that the minister would be symbolically locked into the pulpit. Then at the end of the service, the whole process would be repeated in reverse order. Safely locked in, presumably it was a symbolic act to remind the minister that he was now locked in to the task of leading the people together into the presence of God. Then, and only then, would the minister say the words that have always had a powerful emotional impact on me, let us worship God. And how did it begin? With the reverential act of bringing a Bible and opening it. That's holy reverence for the word. Here's a fourth implication we'll call continual learning. Continual learning. Paul commanded Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15 to be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Now the translation, be diligent to present yourself approved, is an accurate translation. But I would note that the King James Version's translation of is somewhat of an interpretation of what it means to be diligent based on the admonition to accurately handle the Scripture. The King James Version reads, study to show thyself approved unto God. The point is is that the shepherds of God's flock are charged with the continual learning of the people, and the people ought to take advantage of every learning opportunity. When somebody comes to me, and, and this doesn't happen often, but they... They say, I just don't feel like I'm growing here. I I don't know what to say to that. I don't know what to say to that. That's like saying I'm dehydrated, even though I've been standing in the rain for a couple years. I mentioned this morning the Irish missionary Columba, who was born in 521. He devoted his life first to the Irish and then to the Scottish peoples. He was an evangelist, and he, he traveled to bring the gospel to those who had never heard the gospel of Christ, but he was also a trainer of ministers in the gospel, and Some of them had been to Rome, just a few of them had been exposed to the great libraries, the many books. Rome was considered the capital of Christianity, but most of them hadn't been to Rome to study. That was a a once-in-a-lifetime trip for a few. And so they really only had one text upon which to base their ministry. They only had the Bible. Now, these were monks, and not in the way we think of them today, but more genuine ministers of the gospel. They loved the Bible, And the way they learned the Bible was to copy it by hand incessantly and repeatedly. Columba himself translated or or transcribed rather and wrote out Matthew, Mark, Luke, John and the Psalms over 300 times. He was actually in the middle of writing Psalm 34 when he felt a cold chill on his body. He was dead in a couple of hours and somebody noticed that the very last words he ever wrote were They that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. That's how I want to go, having been saturated in the word. Continual learning. If you will continually learn, if you will continually grow, if you will come every time with the expectation that God has something to teach you, God has something to show you, God has something in his word that is brand new for you today. I know God has something that's brand new for you in his word every Sunday. You know why? Because I learn something that's new every Sunday. I will not preach a sermon where I didn't learn. Here's one more implication, a fifth one, determined transformation. Determined transformation. I mentioned earlier 2 Timothy 3.16, the bedrock of orthodox bibliology. Let's return to it now as Paul shows us what the transformation given to us by the word of God looks like. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed, and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. First of all, the Bible is the content of the church's teaching. There's no other valid source which carries any authority. 
All other sources must be used only to help us understand the Scripture, but they're not standalone authorities. There's a lot of Bible to cover, and so the foundation of teaching in the church has to be robust, it has to be aggressive, there has to be high quantity, it has to be high quality. Second, the Scriptures give reproof. This is a Greek word that means to expose or to convict. I really like the English translation, though. Reproof is helpful because it has the idea of reproving something that you've already believed. If the Christian is reproved when reminders of obedience and trust in the Lord are given through the Scriptures, then that's always a good thing. And then you have the flip side to that. Thirdly, the Word of God gives correction. The wayward course of sin or poor judgment or lack of wisdom is corrected. I think an easy way to see this is to see reproof as the Scripture's authority to command Christians to stop sin and correction as Scripture's authority to command Christians to start doing positive obedience and godly actions. And then finally, Paul says, the Bible gives training in righteousness. What does that mean? It means through the knowledge of the word, teaching, the reminders and rebukes of the word, reproof, the positive actions of obedience to the word, correction, and the Christian grows in Christ-likeness, grows in righteousness. Listen, this is radically different than a sentimental view of Scripture as that which gives good feelings and moral lessons. This is a view of Scripture that says it is a surgeon's scalpel and it is sutures to stitch up and heal the wounds inflicted by the surgeon when spiritual cancers are removed. Just as our launching point this evening was Jeremiah 1, 9, and 10, this is exactly what God's Word is designed to do. It uproots, it tears down, It causes to perish. It pulls down. Then and only then it builds up and plants. The church which will commit herself to the determined transformation will experience the glories of the sanctification and cleansing power of the magnificent Bible. Listen very carefully. This is the whole point. If you're God, to whom are you going to entrust the greatest works of the gospel? to those who know Him the best, to those who know Christ, to those who are sanctified, to those who are living holy lives. Those are the ones you entrust the works of the gospel. So for me, this is not just about us living holy, sanctified lives, although that is a tremendously high and lofty goal. The goal is to live glorious, holy, sanctified lives so that God will use us. Amen? Listen to this verse from a a hymn. This verse goes, O ever be our guide, our shepherd and our pride, our staff and song. Jesus, O Christ of God, by your enduring word, lead us where you have trod, make our faith strong. This is a hymn written 1,800 years ago by Clement of Alexandria. It's a hymn called Shepherd of Tender Youth. He's in, this is important because he's in a generation right after the apostles. And whether they believe, they look to the word of God alone to strengthen their faith. Through the scripture, Jesus leads where he has trod and makes our faith strong. My prayer for our church is that we never become Bible church in sign only. That we never have a memory of a once fervent love for the scriptures. This is to be the central focus of the church that would follow her Savior of whom John wrote, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Our Father, we ask you humbly to apply these words to our lives. In the many ministries you have so blessed us with, our main worship services, our Sunday school classes, our children's ministry, our student ministries, women's ministry, men's ministry, small groups, mentoring, all the different ways that we seek to open your Bible. Oh, Lord, I pray that your word would do its work in our midst, that we would see the transformation, the sanctification of of all of us, Lord, that compositely as the local church, 
we would be pleasing instruments in your hand. And we would humbly ask that as we seek holiness and sanctification through your word, through being continual learners, that you would entrust to us the lost, that you would save them, and you would entrust them to us to disciple and grow them into sanctification as well. We ask this humbly as those who would follow after our dear Savior. We are his slaves. He is the master. And so we ask in all humility and in his name. Amen.